Is anybody here a history buff? Okay, way more people than last service. This is good. I would love to claim that I'm a history buff because history deeply fascinates me. But I'm gonna be real with you. I just, I can't stick with other people. There are other people in this world who are so deeply invested in history way more than I am. And my dad is one of those people. When I was younger, he added onto our house and built an entire library bookshelf. And on it, there is not a single book. It is full of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of VHS tapes. And most of these VHS tapes are different historical documentaries that talk about different times of life. And I grew up watching these with my dad throughout my whole childhood. And the ones that I remember the most were the documentaries about World War II. My dad, he was born right after the end of the war and his dad served in the war as a merchant marine. And so he was really interested in World War II and kind of as a result ended up passing some of that interest on to us. And so I love to this day learning about this time period and I still love watching these old documentaries. And there's a reason for that is that these documentaries, they make it very real to me. That I mean, I grew up in school kind of getting the Cliff Notes version of World War II because you'd learn about it and talk about it, and you'd see it kind of glamorized in movies. But those documentaries give you a different perspective on it. It reminds you that these were very real people who made very real sacrifices to bring victory over the Axis powers. And so while we celebrated the victory, it was also important for us to understand and remember the sacrifice that led to it. Well, we're finishing up our series, Dinners with Jesus, this morning. What we've been doing is taking three weeks to look at different moments where Jesus uses a meal to make lasting impact in the lives of others. And so we started the first week by looking at the feeding of the 5,000. Last week, we looked at Jesus and his meal with the Pharisees. And this week, we're going to look at Jesus as he has the last supper with his disciples. And he uses this as an opportunity to talk to them about his coming death, but also to establish communion as he talks about the sacrifice that he was about to make. And when we celebrate communion and we talk about Jesus' death, I think there's a very real danger in letting Jesus' sacrifice become commonplace to us. Because we talk so often and you hear so often about Jesus' death that if we're not careful, it becomes just another part of the Sunday story. But we need to remind ourselves that Jesus was a real person who died a very real death as a sacrifice of the sins of the world. And so while we are to worship and ultimately celebrate in his victory, we also need to remember the sacrifice that led to that victory. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps with you, you can turn to Luke 22, and that's where we'll be for most of the morning. And we're gonna start by looking at verses seven through 13 together. It said, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. And they said, where do you want us to prepare it? They asked, and he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room and where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. So they left and found things just as Jesus told them. And so they prepared the Passover. So during this time, Israel is celebrating what they call the Passover. And what this was, was a time of year where they would reflect on the events of the Exodus, which takes place in the Old Testament. And these were the events where Jesus, or God, led Israel out of Egypt and into Canaan, the promised land. And so they would celebrate this as with a big festival and a week-long meal. But during this time, the day before Jesus decides to prepare this meal for his disciples, you also need to know that Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, decides to betray Jesus. He meets with the chief Pharisees and the chief priests, and he accepts a bribe of 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus and give them his location. And so as we pick up in our passage today, you'll notice that Jesus is very secretive with his disciples. He doesn't give them a location to meet at. Instead, he tells them to look for a sign, which is a man carrying a pitcher of water. And he even passes on his message with this anonymity, right? He refers to himself as the teacher only when talking to the master of the house. And Jesus does all of this because he already knows that Judas has betrayed him. And if he gave the disciples an exact location of where to meet, then Judas would be able to tell that to the Roman soldiers and they would be able to arrest Jesus before he could talk with his disciples. But Jesus wanted one last moment with them before his arrest and death. So look at our next verses. These are verses 14 through 18. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds my fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. So as Jesus prepares to give this Passover meal with his disciples, 
it's not a regular Passover meal and it's not really a time of celebration. Jesus understands and is very well aware that he's about to die. And so he knows that this is probably going to be his last moment with all of his disciples before his death. And so he uses this opportunity to not only prepare them for what's about to come, but also to explain what exactly he was going to do. And so for us, if we want to understand what exactly it is that Jesus was going to do, we need to really understand what the Passover meal stood for. See, for all of Israel, every element of the Passover meal held great symbolic significance. You would have bitter herbs that represented the bitter memory of slavery in Israel. You would have um, a paste made of fruits and nuts that represented the mortar Jewish slaves would use to build Egyptian storehouses. You would have parsley dipped in salt water, which represented both the hyssop, which was the plant they used to spread the, bloods, uh, the lamb's blood over the doorpost, but it also represented the tears that Israel shed throughout all of slavery. You would have a rack of lamb or goat that represented the sacrificial lamb, and you would have the matzah, which was unleavened bread as a representation of manna in the wilderness. It was the, God, the bread that God provided. And you would also have a boiled egg that would be roasted in a pan that represented the temple sacrifice, which would allow you to be able to enter the temple on the day of the festival. And then last, you would have four cups of wine present throughout the meal. And these four cups represented different moments of redemption that God lays out for Israel in Exodus 6, 5 through 7. And so as we read this, you'll see these moments highlighted. It said, moreover, I've heard the groaning of Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I've remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So these four different cups of wine would be drunk throughout different parts of the meal. And so the first cup, you would be drunk before the meal with the Kaddush, which was a prayer of blessing. You would drink the second cup during the meal and the last two cups will be drunk after the meal at specific points. So every element and part of the, Lord's, or the, the Passover meal had great significance to Israel. It represented every element of provision and redemption that God had provided for Israel. And so as Jesus sits with his disciples and he walks with them through the Passover, Jesus is very well aware that in his coming death and his sacrifice that he would replace the Passover meal. And so as he sits with his disciples, he says that he's eager to sit with them. And this isn't because he just wanted one last meal. Jesus wanted to help them understand that what he was about to do would change everything for them. See, oftentimes we talk about Jesus as just merely being a sacrificial lamb. And there's truth in this, right? Jesus is the lamb of God who is slain for the sins of the world as foretold by John the Baptist. But he's so much more than that. That Jesus isn't just the sacrificial lamb, he's the whole meal. That he's the bitter herbs remembered as his brutal death and, and sacrifice on the cross. He's the tears as he shed tears as God turned away from him on the cross. He is the bread of life broken over God's people. He is the hyssop, the blood of the lamb that is spread across God's people. He is the sacrificial lamb as the sacrifice for the, oh my gosh, I can't get that word out. He is the sacrificial lamb slain for the sins of the world. He is the foundation of our faith and he is the temple sacrifice that allows us to be in the presence of God. That what Jesus was going to do through his death and his sacrifice was to change everything. Jesus was going to establish a new covenant through his sacrifice. And see, when he does this, Jesus also tells his disciples that he will not partake in a Passover again until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. And this is what scholars refer to as an eschatological reference. And what this means is that Jesus is talking about the end times here. Jesus is referencing his second coming that's talked about in Revelations 19. And this is the moment where Jesus comes back. He is reunited with his people and they celebrate together in what scripture calls the wedding supper of the lamb. And Jesus talks about this for a couple of reason, reasons. The first one is, is that he wants his disciples to understand that everything was going to be okay, that in the end he would win. He was about to go through a brutal death on the cross, but ultimately he would be victorious. But he also wanted us to understand through his reference to the kingdom of God being fulfilled, that he wanted us to understand the heart behind everything that he was about to do. That Jesus' heart is that all people would come to know and follow him. And so he's been planning for this through his death, his resurrection, and ultimately his second coming. 
And Paul talks about it a little bit in Titus 2, 11 through 14. He says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, that it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Jesus' desire is that all people would be his people. But in order for that to happen, the Mosaic Covenant would have to be replaced because the Mosaic Covenant dealt directly with Israel. But Jesus sought to redeem all of mankind. And so in order for that to happen, he planned from the beginning of creation to create a new covenant through an act of great redemption, even greater than the Exodus. See, in verses 17 and 18, the cup that Jesus distributes to his disciples is the cup of redemption. And so it refers to the great acts of redemption that God did for Israel. And if you'll know, you'll know that Jesus doesn't drink from this cup. He actually gives it to his disciples and tells him to distribute it amongst themselves. And Jesus, you'll also notice that he tells them to drink all of this cup. Traditionally, this would be a cup that would just be sipped from. You would not drink the whole thing. But Jesus telling the disciples to divide it evenly amongst themselves and drink all of it puts a very big, important focus on the cup of redemption. Because for Jesus, he knew that he was about to replace this cup, that while they were experiencing and reflecting on God's redemption, ultimately Jesus would become the full redemption of man, that there would be no need for future sacrifices because Jesus' death was going to be the final, ultimate act of redemption for all of mankind. And see, this is what makes Jesus so different from everyone else. This is what makes Christianity so different from every other religion, is that every other religion is about man making your way up to a God. And so most religions typically require you to try to tip the scales in favor of you. And so you're in this per relentless pursuit of trying to do good. And maybe if you're lucky, I mean, maybe, on judgment day, you've done your job, maybe. And even for Israel, although they had forgiveness of sins, it wasn't final, that you had to constantly sacrifice sins or sacrifice for your sins. And every single year, the entire nation of Israel would have to make a sacrifice on the day of atonement for the sins of the nation. So no matter what you did, no sacrifice could ever cover all of your sins. But here's what makes Jesus so radically different is that God himself came down to earth. He lived the life that we could not live he died the death that we deserved as payment for sin, that the punishment and payment of sin was put upon the sacrificial lamb as he was crucified on the cross. And in his death, in his dying breath, Jesus said three words. He said, it is finished. And with those three words, he sealed the deal, that the payment of sin was finally taken care of. Sin was permanently paid for through the sacrifice of the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ. And it's in this incredible act of redemption that we see just how radically different Jesus is. That every other religion is about man making their way to a God. But Christianity is about God making a way for us. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except through me that we don't have to work our way to God, that God came to us and it's through a relationship with Jesus, through faith and repentance that we find forgiveness of sins and eternal life with Jesus. And see, it's this act of redemption that Jesus is talking about with his disciples as they take this cup. It's our redemption that sin is permanently paid for. And as the disciples finish the ceremonial cup of redemption, Jesus was preparing this new and better cup. Look what happens in our last verses. These are 19 and 20. It said, and he took the bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So as Jesus walks through this Passover meal with his disciples, it was tradition that the head of the house would give a speech of blessing over the bread and the cups. 
And so typically what would happen is he would stand up and he would say a prayer of blessing that invited people to take part in Passover that wanted to. But Jesus doesn't give this traditional Passover speech. That as the disciples finish this original Passover meal, Jesus institutes a new Passover through the bread and the wine. Now the disciples, they're no strangers to hearing Jesus talk about his suffering. And really at this point, they're not even strangers to Jesus talking about his death. But they've never really heard it in this context. See, in verse 20, the cup that Jesus lifts is the cup of consummation. And this was a symbol of the final shedding of the lamb's blood, and it signified God's creating of a covenant with Israel. And so what Jesus is doing here is he is telling that through the breaking of his body, which is the bread, that he was providing final redemption for all of mankind. And it would be through the shedding of his blood that he would provide a new covenant with Israel. And as Jesus talks through this Passover meal with the disciples and talks about his death, it's had to be a somber moment. Because yes, ultimately the disciples will get to relish in the victory over sin and death that Jesus would accomplish. But it would come at a great cost. Jesus would have to die a brutal death on the cross and his disciples would have to witness it. And yet, Jesus calls his disciples to remember him. In both verses 19 and 20, as Jesus commands his disciples to take the bread and the wine, he says to do this in remembrance of him. That yes, they were to celebrate in the victory they would find in Jesus, but they were to never forget the sacrifice that led to it. And this is the same thing that we celebrate when we take communion as the global church, that as we take the bread and the juice, we are partaking in the suffering of Jesus. We are remembering the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us. And if you've been at Karis City for any length of time, you know that we take communion every single week as a church. And we don't do that because it's just kind of a part of our like Sunday morning routine. We do that because the death and the resurrection of Jesus are crucial to who we are, that it is what provides us forgiveness of sins. It is what leads us to have eternal life with God. And we never want to forget that. But there's a very real danger that's starting to become common in the modern church regarding communion. That I think we get so accustomed to taking the bread and the juice that we forget to really stop and think about what it is that Jesus did to provide us for forgiveness of sins. And if we're not careful, the death and the sacrifice of Jesus becomes just another part of the Sunday story to us. And it loses the weight that it's meant to carry. And this is why we have to remember what it is that Jesus went to. We have to walk through this and remind ourselves that Jesus was a real person. He was the real son of God. And he died a very real death for the sacrifices of our sin, that this is not just some story in a book. But if we ever hope to truly understand what it is that Jesus did on the cross, we need to understand the details of what Jesus went through. And so I want to walk through that with you this morning. We're going to talk about the arrest and the crucifixion and death of Jesus in great detail. And as we do this, I have a little challenge for you. Take your phones, take your notebooks, take your Bibles, whatever, put them down. Take this moment, pause, lock in, and really listen to what it is that Jesus went through for you. And understand, this isn't just something out of a book. These are historical things that are written in historical documents along with the Bible. But as Jesus finishes this meal with his disciples, it's at this time Judas would leave to betray Jesus. He goes to get the Roman soldiers, and at this point, Jesus begins to pray. And as Jesus is praying, he asks God, he says, if it is your will, take this away from me. Do not let me die this death. But ultimately, he accepts that it's the will of the Father. And Jesus is so stressed by this point that the Bible writes that he is sweating drops of blood. And this is not just some talk. This is a medical condition called hematidrosis. And it happens as a response to extreme stress. It's a rare bodily response. And it leaves your skin weak and soft. And as Jesus finishes praying, Judas arrives. 
He points Jesus out to the soldiers. Jesus is arrested. He is taken to a secret trial with the chief priests where he is falsely accused and convicted of heresy. After this trial, the guards who were watching over Jesus took him, they blindfolded him, they beat him, and they mocked him saying, go ahead, prophesy who it was who hit you. After this, they had their fun and they took Jesus to Pilate. The Roman governor sits with Jesus and by the end of his conversation with Jesus, he finds that he's innocent, but he's still facing an angry Pharisee group. And so in order to appease them, he decides to publicly flog Jesus. And so Jesus is taken, he is tied to a pole, he is stripped of his clothes and he is beaten with the Roman cat of nine tails. And the cat of nine tails is a weapon, it's a whip made of nine strips of leather with heavy, heavy metal balls on the end of it and shards of bone embedded into the leather. And each time Jesus was hit with this whip, those metal balls would bruise this soft broken skin that was weakened by hematidrosis. And these bones would embed themselves into Jesus' flesh, ripping it away. With every hit of the whip, Jesus' flesh would be torn from his body. His skin would be ripped away, leaving a new layer to be hit and ripped off with every consecutive hit. It's very likely that Jesus suffered more than the prescribed 39 lashes. And by the end of his flogging, Jesus' skin and his flesh, his muscles would hang from his back like ribbons. Jesus, after suffering extreme blood loss and extreme trauma would likely, trauma would likely be in shock, barely able to stay conscious. But after his flogging, he's taken by the Roman soldiers and he's mocked again. They take a purple robe and they place it over Jesus, likely clotting his blood. But then they fashion a crown of thorns. They place it on his head and they beat it into his skull. Jesus' skin weakened from the hematidrosis is pierced all around and blood profusely pours out as the capillaries burst. And they mock Jesus yelling, hell, king of Jews. Jesus is then taken, put in public, in front of the public by Pilate. The public is given an opportunity to release Jesus, but instead the worst was yet to come. Jesus would be condemned to be crucified as the crowd would release the murderer Barabbas instead of Jesus. And so a weak, bleeding, in shock Jesus would now have to weakly carry his cross a half a mile to Golgotha to be crucified. And Jesus, as he slowly makes his way, has suffered so much blood loss at this point that he's at a point of extreme exhaustion. The weight of the cross becomes too much to bear and he collapses under it. A man by the name of Simon of Cyrene is appointed to carry the cross and he helps Jesus to his feet and they struggle to make their way to Golgotha. As he's arrived, the robe is ripped back off of Jesus, opening up every one of his wounds again, causing immense pain. Jesus is thrown to the ground and placed on his crossbeam. His arms stretched out. Roman soldiers take seven inch nails and drive them into the wrists of Jesus, suffering the median nerves, causing immense fiery pain to shoot through Jesus' body. They then take Jesus and place him upon the vertical beam of the cross. His feet are bound together, one on top of the other, they are brought up to a point where the knees are bent and they take another seven inch nail and they drive it through his feet, severing more major nerves and causing fiery pain to now shoot from his feet through his body. At this point, they take Jesus, they raise him up and they place the cross down upon into its hole to stand. And it's with that that Jesus is crucified. As he hangs on the weight of his wrists, fiery pain would shoot through his body Jesus would struggle to breathe. He would be able to inhale, but based on the position of the way he hung, he could not exhale because of the positioning of his diaphragm. And so in order for Jesus to breathe out, he would then have to push up on his feet just to be able to let his breath out. And once he did this, he would fall back on the weight of his wrists, again, causing that pain to fire through him. His bare flesh would grind against the wood he suffered so much blood loss at this point that this was not only an incredibly painful process, but it was incredibly difficult. 
Jesus would only be able to do this a few times. We know that he did it enough to speak seven times, but there would be a point where Jesus becomes too weak to do this anymore. Unable to lift himself up, Jesus would die of cardiac arrest and asphyxiation. The Roman soldiers took a spear and they pierced Jesus' side to make sure that he was dead, piercing his heart and allowing blood to pour out. And with that, the sacrificial lamb was slain for the sins of the world. That's what Jesus went through for you. That this isn't just some story, that this was a real event. It's the greatest thing that anyone has ever done for us. It's the greatest sacrifice known to man that Jesus loved you so much that he endured the greatest pain medically known to a human being. And he did that because he wanted to provide you with forgiveness of sins and have a relationship with you. And each week when we take communion, when we take this bread and we take this juice, that's what we're remembering, that we're taking part in the suffering of Jesus and we're remembering this brutal sacrifice that led to the most beautiful thing anyone has ever done for us. So how do we respond to the sacrifice of Jesus? Well, as Jesus commands his disciples to take the bread and the wine, the word that he uses for remembrance is actually a Greek word that refers to the idea of a memorial sacrifice. It was an act of worship done in the temple. And so Jesus was inviting his disciples in the light of this gruesome sacrifice to worship their savior. And he's inviting us to do the same. That the sacrifice of Jesus should lead us to the worship of Jesus. The communion is not just merely about remembering Jesus, but it's that we would be led to glorify him as we remember his death, but we celebrate in the victory that we have through his resurrection. And so we're gonna put that into practice as a church this morning. In just a minute, we're gonna take communion together as a church. We're gonna break the bread. We're gonna drink the juice as a remembering of Jesus' broken body and the shedding of his blood. And then after that, we're gonna spend a lot of time in worship. We have three songs so that we can praise Jesus for what he's done. And my challenge to you as we do this is spend this time in reflection. Think about all it is that Jesus went through and did for you. And let that lead you to worship your Lord and Savior. Well, as a close this morning, I wanna leave you with a quote from Angela Foligno. She was a famous Christian in the 13th century, and this is what she said about communion. She said, if we but paused for a moment to consider attentively what takes place in this sacrament, I am sure that the thought of Christ's love for us would transform the coldness of our hearts into a fire of love and gratitude. When we stop and really reflect on what it is that Jesus went through for us. It leads us to worship. It ignites a passion inside of us. It leads us to be obedient to Jesus as we worship him as Lord. And it leads us to praise as we worship him as savior. So this morning, don't forget the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Remember what he did on the cross and let that lead you to worship your Lord and Savior. Let's pray.